There is a place that is spoken about only in whispers. A dark area that spawns the beginnings of urban legends. A place where anything can happen and usually does. During the light of day it hides just outside of you. But when the sun goes down, spirits, creatures of the night, roam free. And things do go bump in the night. It is in every state and every country, and there is no escaping it, no matter how safe you feel behind your locked doors and latched windows. So we invite you to turn down the lights and turn up your radio while we join Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis, your hosts, on a journey into the darkness on the edge of town. Hello and welcome. You're tuned in to the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Dave Schrader, that cuddly fellow over there. Well, that's Mr. Tim Dennis. Hello, Tim. Howdy. All right. We've got a lot to cover. I, we, I mean, like a massive amount of news. So I'll be sprinkling in just a few uh, of, of the emails, Tim. But okay. we've got so much news to move through. It was like, well, you know, sometimes I get a lot of news, but I can weed out a lot of it. Because it's, you know, that, that's not a very compelling story. Or you know, I just don't like the, the theme or it's poorly written. And I'll get us down to about 12 stories per week. Mm-hmm. But uh, this week, we got a lot of stories to cover, a lot of craziness going on. Plus, I figured I'd take the opportunity to uh, do a little house cleaning and, and mention a few other things. First of all, um, we uh, were just contacted by uh, Discovery Networks and Travel Channel with the launch of their new Discovery Plus platform, which is going to be huge. It starts January 4th. They're going to be making um, their own streaming service. All of these great shows you can subscribe to, you can now watch ad-free. Wow. So people are going to be thrilled that they can get all their favorite Discovery channels. And there's like 12 of them, eight eight or eight to 12 channels that are under the Discovery umbrella. And now you'll be able to watch all those shows on the streaming platform ad-free, which means Holzer Files ad-free. Wow. Yeah. So they've got a lot of resources they're putting into that. A lot of things going on. And uh, our mid-season break is here. So we will be coming back a little bit in the early parts of 2021 after the new streaming platforms up and about. Our show will still be on Travel Channel, but they're just launching and they're putting all of their their efforts into this launch of the new Discovery Plus channel. So that's really cool. And uh, we're going to be returning to the airwaves. I'm believing they said it's going to be around March that we'll be back with uh, the this final seven episodes of this hmm. season of the Holzer files. And this isn't bad news at all, folks. This is nothing to do with bad news. It's just that they're trying to make room for everything that they've got that they have to air before the end of this year and make sure that they've got everything in, in line for their streaming platforms by the beginning of the year. So they just want to make sure that their, their good shows get the attention that they deserve. So that's, that's all that's going on. So don't freak out. We're not freaked out. Uh, I'm still going to do some cool little special episodes of darkness radio, kind of like I was doing the, uh, Holzer files, uh, you know, Holzer's ghosts episodes. Tim and I have talked about a couple of, of interesting concepts that we might be developing to, uh, you know, still plug in a few bonus episodes here yeah. and there. Yeah. So keep tuning in for that. I do want to point out to, um, you know, this, Last week, of course, Tuesday, I uh, believe. Let's say last week, yesterday, Tim. Um, I'm see. We we record these out of order, folks. I'm actually recording this on Tuesday, December eighth, but we're airing it on Wednesday, December 9th, and talking about it as though today is the ninth. But yesterday was the what fortieth anniversary of the assassination of John Lennon, right? And uh, Monday we released. Um, well, we. I posted all of my social media. We did a really compelling episode in 2007 Mm -hmm. with um, Chip Coffee and Maria Simpson. Uh, It was called The Possession of Mark David Chapman. And it tells a different story that a lot of people are unaware of regarding the assassin of John Lennon. And we have some – I. it stands out to me, again, as one of my favorite episodes of the past. It's from our second season on the air. And – I threw a mental monkey bar or uh, monkey wrench into Maria Simpson's mind. And from what I've been told, she stopped talking about this 
after our interview because of an aspect of the case that she didn't consider and it really unnerved her. Hmm. So she never really did more interviews regarding this. And, um, it's, it's a really interesting, compelling episode. It was a two, two hour show. So I've got that up on our social media, or if you just go through the app and go back to, I think it was, uh, do you remember? It was February of 2007. Hey, was the original air date. Yeah, yeah. So if you just scroll back through our archives, go back into February. If you're looking, you can find it that way, and it'll be the possession of Mark David Chapman. But you can find both hours there and listen to it from uh, your app, uh, however you're listening to today's program. So I wanted to make mention of that um, because that's that's pretty cool. Uh, and, and it's an interesting, fascinating weird look into a case people might not have even considered there could have been um something strange and supernatural you know i've we've heard the conspiratorial angle of it right you know that that government was behind the assassination of lenin because they didn't like his uh subversive ways but you know that's not what we talk about on the show we talk about mark david chapman by somebody who knew him very well and and some really chilling insights into this guy. So that's, that's that. Um, so we got those two things out of the way. Next, I want to do a quick review of the movie freaky. It's on video on demand. We've talked about it off and on, on the show. This is a great movie, man. It's a fun, irreverent, silly romp. Uh, Catherine Newton, uh, stars in the movie as does Vince Vaughn. And it is good to see Vince back in a role that really kind of fits him. You know, he, he was such a powerhouse through the 90s and early 2000s. And then you just don't hear much about Vince Vaughn anymore. Yeah, He's, His comic timing and, and personality is is really interesting. And, and I think he just got tired of starting to play himself and everything. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that, yeah. But um, this movie makes him stretch. It's, it's a twist on Freaky Friday. Right. As a matter of fact, I think I think it was originally referred to as Freaky Friday the 13th. Um, and the concept is that this town has this legend of this this killer who comes out of hiding every like 10 or 15 years and starts slaughtering teens uh, around homecoming time. And, you know, they're kind of laughing it off. And, you know, how could this be? And, and he, you know, the movie opens up with an attack. And he ends up acquiring a really weird dagger from this location that he breaks into. And um, he ends up attacking Catherine Newton. And I'm, I'm not giving anything away because this is all in the commercials and the trailers for it. And they somehow swap bodies. So her soul goes into Vince Vaughn. His soul goes into her. And she becomes Murder Barbie. Um, and it's, it's really well done. For those of you that enjoy Jumanji and seeing Jack black portraying a teenage girl uh <laughs> you're gonna enjoy vince vaughn who is like six foot 20 and <laughs> to see him be effeminate without being um what's the right word for this over the top yeah it's he's not over the top he's not he's not doing it in an exploitative way it's not like he's you know acting like a big airy fairy you know flit he he plays it well, but like his running just breaks me up. Um, to see him run in this kind of effeminate manner without it being again over exaggerated, he does such a good job, and it's it's really good acting. In it, I, 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 this is the weirdest way I could say this. You're gonna watch Vince Vaughn be like, God, Catherine Newton's really good at, in this role, and then you're like, What am I saying? You know, uh, it's Vince Vaughn acting like Catherine Newton and, and Catherine Newton acting like Vince Vaughn. And when she flips that switch, she's a really good maniacal character. And there's a lot of Easter eggs throughout the movie. Um, you know, I'll, I'll throw you one during the big party scene. If you pay attention, there's somebody dressed, uh, with the fedora and the Freddy Krueger sweater, but they're not in makeup. They're not dressed as Freddy Krueger, hmm. but this whole movie is just fun nods to, horror and it's done really well. There's, uh, you know, her two best friends and, 
and everybody and how she has to convince everybody who she really is. Meanwhile, they're all searching for this killer. It's just a fun movie. And this is made by the same people that did uh, Happy Death Day and Happy Death Day 2, which I enjoyed both of those movies. Uh, as a matter of fact, I did the live tweeting this weekend with Kevin Smith, uh, during the, you know, I was one of the influencers they asked to live view it with Kevin Smith and tweet about it. And, uh, I said, I would love to see a freaky death day movie. I'd love to see them, them somehow cross these two movies over and it could be done very easily. Um, but it'd be fun to see something like that happen on the show. So I'm hoping that, you know, that would take place. The director laughed and, um, it was it was just a fun time, but Freaky is a good video on demand movie. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you right now; it's about 19.99. But if you've got like me, I've got six of us that sat down to watch the movie. We couldn't do that if we went out to a movie theater, right? Yeah, and it's one of those movies. It's great and fun, and would have probably been great in a crowd. But you know, it's one you don't have to see on a big screen to thoroughly enjoy it. Yeah. So, and I say I mentioned that because like I'm not sure how I feel about. Movies like King Kong versus Godzilla and Wonder Woman 1984 going over to um, HBO Max because, you know, I, I, I have HBO Max and I'll enjoy watching them. But there are some movies like Godzilla versus King Kong and, and Wonder Woman and Justice League. You kind of want to see it on the big screen. You know, <laughs> I come from an interesting perspective in that uh, I don't want to get sick again. You know, so right, right. no, I, I'm just, I, would, I understand that aspect. It's just, like I said, that's the one thing I do miss about this is yeah. I miss being able to see right. and, extravaganzas and, on a big screen. No, but I'm torn. But I'm just saying, I, and I'll fin- I, I want to finish that thought in that I'm torn. I, I, I want to go to the theater so badly to see Wonder Woman 84, but, but I'm glad that I have that option that I have that option to sit down in front of HBO Max and see it at home. Because I do have a a 60-inch TV with a decent stereo system, and you know what? I think I can get by by seeing it that way. Right. You know, and and not put myself in. Yeah. I was just mentioning that that's the part that, that's the only part that kind of bums me out about movies going on to video on demand, which I think is the future of movies anyway. I, and I think we'll prove once we get this COVID nonsense under wraps, <clears throat> I think they're going to be smart if they do allow video on demand launches and theater launches, because there are going to be people that are purists like me who given that chance and to be safe and healthy, you know, um, will watch it at home on TV. But there are some instances where, I would rather sit at home and watch a comedy on video on demand than go to a theater anyway. But then you've got your bigger extravaganza movies that you want to see play out on the big screen. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I hope that they'll consider continue doing this when we get COVID under control. Well, you have those blockbusters you have to see on a big screen. I mean, there's just, you have to. And and then like you pointed out, there's those movies that, you know, you've got dramas and rom-coms and, and comedies and stuff like that that, you know, you, you could settle to watch down in the man cave or, or you know, upstairs, uh, you know, with the lady. You you, you just, you, you you don't necessarily have to go out for that. Maybe you could pay the elevated price at home for and you, you'd be just fine. Well, I want to address something, folks. <clears throat> Tim and I, I think you've come to know if you've been listening to the show even over two weeks or 15 years. We are empathetic. We always want to try to represent the best of people and the best of stories. And, uh, you know, if we make missteps or say something that might seem uncharacteristic, if you want to call us on it, that's fine. We always are looking for ways to improve our delivery and things that we bring. So I'm totally down with that. It's in the way that people choose to address me. And I, I, I tell you, in the last week, I've received a couple of heated emails that were very angry. And I've, I've approached them with kindness and apologies because of misunderstanding. And I'm going to read part of an email that I got the other day, and we're going to address it. Uh, Dear Mr. Schraders and Dennis, I listened to your last show because I and my wife – uh, from Texas have listened to your show from episode three of darkness radio. 
And I was disgusted to hear you saying you had been to Ireland, as did your guest. There is no such country as Ireland. There is the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, both of which are internationally recognized as se uh, separate countries. Ireland has not been Ireland since 1922 when it was part of the UK. And Ireland as a country has not existed since 930 AD. After that, until 1922, it was part of the UK. You and your guest, by saying you were in Ireland, have both supported the IRA and the people they blew to pieces, including my uncle and two cousins. And I do not want to hear you were naive because you should have been aware and I also know you were previously here, Dave, uh, but what I shall do is make sure that every advertiser on your show and on Stitcher is aware as to why they should not be supporting, um, should not be supporting you. And, uh, I will be letting my 7,000 supporters on Twitter know this sign disgusted. Well, I sat back and I, you know, I've, we have some friends over there mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I messaged them and I'm like, Hey, you've heard me talk about the, sh you know, Ireland on the show. You've been on our show or whatever. And I said, when I refer to it as Ireland, does that piss you off? And they're like, no, because you're American and we understand you don't understand the history here. And I was like, okay, but explain to me, am I far off? And they're like, no, this could definitely be insightful to people that are purists and, and, um, you know, that they get irritated that you don't know the history. And I wrote to this guy, I said, Hey, you know, it'd be great if you just be a gentleman and tell me this instead of threatening my advertisers and my podcast platform and everything, um, to stop supporting the show, just inform me. I'm always willing to be educated. And, uh, you know, he ended up talking to his wife who he mentioned is from Texas and she helped, m you know, make him aware of the fact that, Hey, in America, they just know it as Ireland. Right. That's just the way it is. Exactly. And, yeah. Yeah. I was over in Ireland and yeah, I heard them refer to Northern Ireland, but Jesus, you know, there's the Northern States and the Southern States of the United States. There's the Midwest, right? There's the Northwest and Southwest. I didn't, because I don't really understand it. We were there on a tour of ghostly sightings and haunted deals that that's really the parts of the history that they keyed in on telling us. And I've never so, been. <laughs> what? And I've never been. Right. So, yeah. but I wanted to, to make that mention. So I, I did promise him, I said, okay, I thank you very much for alerting me. I will address this and apologize to those that we may have, um, uh, inadvertently upset by our referring to it simply as Ireland. I still don't know the division well enough that I don't know how to proceed Tim, because I, you know, if we're referring to part of it, some of the stories just say, you know, we, we read ghost stories from all over and I've, I know we've read stories from Ireland, but it didn't define Northern Ireland or the people's Republic or, you know, anything like that. It was just, so I, I don't know how to proceed, but I will do this. I promised this gentleman that I would educate because that's what we love to do on the show. Mm -hmm. The Isle, Island of Ireland comprises of the Republic of Ireland, which is a sovereign country and Northern Ireland, which is part of the United Kingdom. The Republic of Ireland endured a, a very hard fought birth ruled from Great Britain since the 13th century. Its citizens, many of them suppressed Catholics, struggled to remove themselves from British domination for the next several hundred years. Ireland's situation changed dramatically at the beginning of the 20th century. In 1919, an Irish Republic was proclaimed uh, and an Irish national uh, uh, nationalist party facing civil war in Ireland, Britain partitioned the island in 1920 with separate parliaments in the predominantly Protestant Northeast and predominantly Catholic South and Northwest. However, the Republicans opposed the formula and in 1922, the Irish free state was then formed almost immediately. The Northeast Northern Ireland withdrew and accepted self-governance within the United Kingdom. Dublin was set as the capital of the Irish Free State. And in 1937, a, a new constitution renamed the National Ire of Ireland, E-I-R-E. -I -E. I'm not sure how to say that, so I apologize again for butchering that. In 1949, it became a republic and left the British Commonwealth. A Protestant majority and Catholic minority in Northern Ireland were in conflict almost from the beginning. 
and in 1969, growing violence between the groups led to the installation of the British Army to maintain the peace. And three years later, terrorist attacks in Ireland and Great Britain led to the direct rule of Northern Ireland by the UK Parliament. In 1985, an Anglo-Irish treaty gave the Republic of Ireland a consulting role in the governing of Northern Ireland. And in 1993, the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom agreed on a framework for resolving problems and bringing lasting peace to the troubled region. The Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland joined the European community on January 1st, 1973, and were integrated into the European Union in 93, when Great Britain announced plans to leave the European Union following a close 2016 referendum. The impact of the initiative on Northern Ireland became a major issue of debate. So a little bit more insight for people like myself that didn't know about that. There's a lot more out there. And I'm, listen, I'm going off of a uh, historic website um, that's trying to give this. So again, if I don't have all the facts right, I'm going off of information that is available to me that, you know, from Britannica. So I was hoping that I would have the most recent and updated information on that. I also received a, a very angry email about our Holzer's ghost episode where we talked to Ty last um, Friday on the program. Uh, we were speaking to Ty Reese or T- Tyree uh, Yacinto of the Lene Lenape tribe discussing the episode of the Holzer files. And during the episode, I was very empathetic to the plight of the indigenous people and the native Americans and received an email afterward from, uh, a very disgruntled person saying that I was, um, basically privileged white person who was having white guilt and that I was painting his people to sound like a bunch of wussies and weaklings. And they were proud warriors and, the, you know, fighters and, and we're strong. And it, again, that's great. I do understand that there are aspects and there were tribes that were like that, but the group that we were speaking about specifically were a peaceful natured group who in involved themselves in a trade program that they didn't fully understand. And they were exploited and butchered, butchered, there's no two ways about it. How do you not have white guilt about that? Knowing that your, your, your four founders found that this was how it would go down. You know, it, you're not getting off our land quick enough. They, they tore babies and, and mother away from their mothers and cut them apart and threw them in the water mm-hmm. and wouldn't allow the parents to get to the children. Then they separated the men and the women. They, it was brutal, brutal. So yes, I'm empathetic to it. Yes. I'm, I feel sorry about it. And there is white guilt. There's white guilt for much of what we've done to build this country and the people whose backs we built it on. Because how do you not uh, feel sad knowing that we've had such, um, such callous disregard for people? You know, it, it's, it's just hard for me. So this person was very angry. I apologized again in an email and said, but you know, I, I, I am ignorant. I, I'm not Native American. I'm not indigenous in that sense. I don't know your stories. That's what I'm trying to do is learn them. That's why we're speaking. I didn't talk to some uh, white you know, professor from a college about your, your plan. I spoke to a member of the Lenape tribe, the daughter of the chief of that tribe, to understand the story better. I'm trying to educate and understand, and that's all I can do. So I just wanted to address that I do read all your emails. I may not always have a chance to respond to every email. Uh, we do try to make adjustments to questions, thoughts, complaints, whatever, on the show and and try to make things flow better. But I want to do it just at least quickly address that aspect of um, what we do. And if you have a problem with something, you're going to get a lot farther being polite. Um, I'll, I'll I'll try to answer even the hatred and angry emails. Uh, because I, what I do find is that usually those people do calm down and realize I'm not the enemy here. Um, and I'm willing to go forward and try to, to uh, educate and encourage people to know the right things. Uh, we only want what's best for our audience as well, man. I want people to learn with us and enjoy what we're doing. So, you know, please just understand that's where our mindset is. Uh, we would never knowingly put down any group of people except for wisconsin and iowa everybody else we're totally down with yeah completely yeah (laughs) (laughs) 
We have no qualms about Wisconsin and Iowa. I mean, we've been doing yeah, that for on. 15 years. I mean, come on. It's Wisconsin and Iowa. Yeah, I mean. Uh, we kid. We have many friends <laughs> in Wisconsin and Iowa. All right, so we got that off of our chests. Um, I wanted to make those mentions. Let's let's cut loose with some uh, supernatural news, Tim. And finally, Tim, finally, a board that, uh, a Ouija board I don't think anybody can complain about. Oh, come on. Really? Right. Yeah. Uh, there's a new naughty Ouija board. Oh. Strictly for adult ghost hunters, Tim. Uh, the article begins with, what do you buy that special someone this Christmas who loves the paranormal and is definitely on Santa's naughty list? Well, Urban Outfitters have come to the rescue with a new naughty Ouija board aimed at couples. <laughs> the spirits have spoken and they want you to have sex, claims the box of this kinky creation from Kepper Games that hit shops this Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> the board itself is a good size, well made, well packaged, if you will, uh -huh. compared to other similar true widget boards. It's also very competitively priced at less than about 15 bucks. That's it? You yeah, you struggle to get a real spirit board of the same quality for the same price or less, although this one would be much less use on actual ghost investigations. Or not. I don't know. Depends on how you want to use it, Tim. The novelty board comes with a red heart shaped planchette. Aww. The idea is that the spirits move the planchette across the board to reveal which love it is night. I feel this is a tool that maybe, you know, what you could do is lay it on the bed with your spouse and just have the spouse place where they want it. You could save a lot of time. <laughs> but maybe there's some intimacy in this. Maybe you both sit naked from one and each other, balancing this precariously on your laps uh, with low candlelight and some, you know, Barry White or air supply uh, in the background. Yeah, I said whoa, that. Whoa, whoa, um, whoa, 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 whoa. Time or out. Barely White supply, if you, you want to mix them. You can't throw the the great Barry oh, White in there and then casually throw air supply in there. That's like. Dare that's like, you, sir. That's like Air saying supply is a God given gift to our ears. That's like it is the honey that drips from Jesus's beard. No, don't, don't, don't oh, honey. don't even, don't even. That's it like, is. that's like saying, I'm going to take the Lamborghini out tonight, or mm -hmm. I could drive the Ford Fiesta. That, that, <laughs> how dare you, sir? There's no, there's no comparison there. There's no, oh, really? yeah. yeah, come on. The board would normally be used by a couple, but could also be used as a group activity, Tim. Hmm? <laughs> if that's your thing. The instructions tell players to start with the planchette in the middle of the game board and ask the spirits to help you figure out what sex position to try tonight. Now, does this not unleash in your mind, Tim, the concept that maybe the ghost is going to hang around to watch? I would think so, yeah. You're going to have an Talk audience. About, yeah, 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 performance anxiety, man. Mm -hmm. And now, what if, whose ghost is it? Is it Grandma Edna? You know, do you really want that? I, I'm going to take it one step further here, Dave. Not only are you going to have ghosts that may watch, you may have ghosts that will participate. And it could be anything from a little slap and tickle to a full-on, you know, mm-hmm. You're saying. Did I lose you? I'm sorry. I just am I'm staring at this and... <laughs> I don't even know. Uh, I, yeah. All right. So if you're lucky, what's going to happen is the planchette will start to move as the spirits guide your hands to one of the 27 erotic illustrations of oh, a couple they're... intertwined okay. in the act of law. Hmm. This is the position, of course, you'll be trying tonight on a traditional Ouija board. Of course, you find the words yes and no. That should probably be on this board, too. Okay. Right. Because right. it should be a safe word. I don't know. Um, in the case of the spirits want you to have sex board, these familiar words are replaced by the naughtier phrases. Yes, yes, yes. And not right now. These yes and no answers allow players to ask kinky questions about the things they think their lover might like. Once the board has suggested a position or screamed yes, yes, yes to one of your naughty suggestions, the planchette should then be encouraged to move to the bottom of the board where you'd normally find the words goodbye. But in this case, the board of, uh, on this board, the text reads good sex. And this is your permission to close the session and get it on. <laughs> Why didn't Dr. Mm -hmm. Ruth think of this? 
I am saying uh, there are a few beliefs when it comes to Ouija boards. Some believe that the spirits of the dead are actually using their energy to slide the planchette around the board, which means it could be the resident spooks in your house choosing how to get your rocks off tonight. <laughs> Others say the Ouija board are evil and call forth demonic entities. If this is true, then you could be in for a very naughty night with the other half. Well, in this sense, you are inviting something to enter you. That's for sure, Tim. Well, there's that, yeah. The other exploration of how Ouija unsubscribed to by skeptics is that the planchette is actually being moved around by our own subconscious thoughts and very subtle involuntary movements. Of course, this could be very interesting given the board's intended use. Although sold as a novelty item, the board may give couples a way to subconsciously make a selection as they will the planchette to move to a symbol depicting a position they perhaps want to try but are too embarrassed to suggest to their partner. This spooky subconscious phenomena known as the ideometer effect by psychologists relies on the participants being somewhat suggestible. So it may be that when the couples place their fingers on the planchette, nothing happens. This opens the board up to another possibility. Cheating. After all, what's the harm if you're in for a sinful night anyway? The board could just as easily be used as a novelty it was intended to be, and a couple could fight with their uh, fingers to move the planchette to their favorite position to win sexual favor. Huh. Hmm. <clears throat> there are a couple positions on here that are unique. Uh, a couple, I just don't even understand how they'd work. <laughs> oh, so? <laughs> I just... Uh, uh, how is it? I, I, I don't know. The two of you kneeling face to face, body to body. Uh, I don't know how you would have the sex doing that. <laughs> you would have the sex doing. Yeah, that. I don't know. I don't. Know. You're you're like on hard flat ground, kneeling facing one another, uh, pressed up against each other. I I don't know how. I don't. Anyway, that's enough for this conversation, uh, and we'll probably get <laughs> Haiti email about this one too. But um, you're the that's one with uh, with with like a a, a a baker's dozen of children, aren't you? You should know how yeah, this one works. I let them do all the hard work, Tim. I'm old. Ah, uh, well, yeah. My my wife, past wives, I should say. That was very bore out of you. You're like my wife. Yeah. <laughs> my wife. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, very weird. Um, speaking of weird, we get a couple more before we go to break here and, and I'll put up a picture. I'm going to put up an email, uh, or not an email. I'm going to put up <laughs> the news stories with the pictures and things that I think you want to see. A little Folks, flustered, so, are you? <laughs> yeah. Go I'm to, uh, 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 <laughs> just, uh, 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 boy, it's a little hot in here. Uh, you go to darknessradio.com, click on the news tab. And uh, you will see the news stories that have pictures, video, or audio, or special links that I think that you're, you're going to want to access. This will be one of those stories. <laughs> uh, this next one will as well. Uh, scary. That's how this title says. Man clicks picture of ghost after hearing strange noises. You zoom noises. I don't know. Why did I say noises? <laughs> I don't know. I think the last uh, story kind of shook you a little bit. <clears throat> a little bit. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> good guy. Mm, uh, yeah. Is it getting really warm in here? Mm. Nah, I'm fine. I'm, I'm Scary. Man clicks picture of ghost after hearing strange noises. If you zoom in on the image, you'll know. He was so frightened that he started packing his bags to move out from there. But before that, he somehow mustered the courage to click a picture in the direction of what he was hearing. Now, whether you believe in ghosts or not, the subject of paranormal sightings and evil spirits intrigues almost everyone. Growing up, we've all heard such ghost stories with utmost interest and fascination, even though they scared the hell out of us. Nevertheless, the internet is full of such creepy tales. And now, a Reddit user has claimed to have captured the image of a ghost. Well, we're not kidding. Notably, the Reddit user named Oopy Soupy Man, Tim. Oopy Soupy Man, you say? <laughs> Soupy man. O P P Y S P O O P Y. Oppy Spoppy man. Oopy Spoopy man. I don't know. Was scared out of his wits when he heard noises in his empty flat. He was so frightened that he started packing his bags to move out from there. But before that, he somehow mustered the courage to snap a picture down the hall. 
He said he heard the sound of feet shuffling around or clothes rubbing against each other. At that time, all his flatmates were at work and he was alone in the flat. So there was no chance of them pulling a prank on him. At first glance, looking at the picture, <clears throat> now I'm going to tell you on the article, the top of the, the article, they've already got the picture blown up and circled. You can see it. But if you quickly scroll down and look at the picture, when you first look at it, nothing really seems out of place. But then when you start to zoom in on the image, you see it's creepy, dude. It's creepy. You, you Again, first glance, you just look, you're like, what's out of the ordinary? I don't, you know. Is that a roll of, uh, of, of paper towels in that kitchen? What am I seeing? And then you realize what it is you're looking at. Hmm. And I don't want to give it away, give it away, give it away now, Tim. <laughs> okay. Because I want, I want people to see this for themselves. But, but you, Tim, you're different. You're special. Aw. I love you in a way that only a man can love another man, Tim. Aw. I'm going to send this picture to you. Well. And I want to just take a quick look at it. Don't, again, don't describe what you're seeing. Just tell me if, if you see it. Okay. Okay. So here comes the image to you. Okay. <clears throat> Let me know what, if anything pops up for you. Hey, no. Did you get it? Did you get it? Uh, it's coming through. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Now, now remind this guy heard shuffling uh -huh. and like banging and noises and he started taking pictures and at the end of the hall, there appears to be a door that leads into the kitchen. Do you see what I see? See, at first glance, you think you see something. See, at first glance, I didn't. I'm like, I don't see anything. I get a lot of pictures like this. But if you do enlarge it, uh, there is definitely clearly something unsettling in that picture. You still not sure out here? No, I'm, I'm, not sure. here. I'm not sure. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to copy and shoot you the image a different way too. Okay. Cause right. that's, that's how I work. All right. Here we go now. All right. And once you see it, it's one of those things. It's like, how the hell did I not see that before? Okay. Now they've blown it up a little bit. So it gets a little bit more pixelated and weird, but do you still see it now? I guess I don't know what I'm looking for. I, okay, you see it in the big circle? See the door frame? Do you see yeah. something? All right, I'm just going to say it. Do you see the head looking out from around the door frame? Oh, is that what that's supposed to be? Yeah. Okay. It's weird. All right. So it's interesting. Uh, so you can go check this article out. It is on darknessradio.com under the news tab. Uh, it is, it's bizarre. Uh, yeah, he wanted out. He said uh, he heard s sounds of feet shuffling, clothes rubbing against each other, and all of his flatmates were at work alone in that flat. He just took that picture, and there you capture something staring back at him. He's moving out now. That's for show. That's for show. A show. Uh, so I, I do want to tell you, because this is also a parashare kind of show. Yep. I've, I've been telling you weird stuff that's been going on at my house. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did I mention uh, recently the crying incident? No, the crying incident? So I've had, okay, so we're sitting there. My daughter-in-law, who's just had my beautiful grandson, Declan, mm -hmm. uh, was downstairs with my son. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife was heading upstairs because she was having a headache and wanted to take a, a hot shower. Mm -hmm. I hear the water go on because the bathroom's right above the living room, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, everything seems to be fine. And my daughter... Pacey, paranormal Pacey, and my stepson Max are sitting on the love seat together, pl talking and uh, jabbering away. And we suddenly hear very clearly the sound of a woman sobbing. And it sounds like it's coming from either right at the top of the stairs or from kind of our back dining room area. Okay. And I stop, and Pacey looks up, and she gets this quizzical look, and Max stops. And I go, Is that mom? But I can hear the shower. There's no, this sounded like it was like right there within five feet of us. Hmm. Maybe five to 10 feet. Okay. This didn't sound muffled. Like it was coming through a vent or from upstairs and I can hear the shower running, but then I'm like, okay, well the stairway, you know, if, if my daughter-in-law, she just had a baby, maybe she's dealing with a little postpartum. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I stop. So I, I called on to my son. I'm like, Linus, Linus. He goes, yeah. And I go, is Claire. Okay. He goes, yeah. Why? She's in the shower. And I said, 
we just heard a woman crying. And he's like, no, not down here. So then that means it was on the same floor as my daughter and stepson and I. There was nobody else there, dude. It was clearly this woman sobbing. Weird. So, all right, tuck that away. We've been having other strange little things. You know, some some of that stuff out of the corner of the eye I see moving and I turn my head and there's nothing there. I'm still skeptical because it's always in lower light settings and I might have the TV on. So I don't know if a reflection off of something from the TV light caught my eye. I'm, I'm very skeptical about those. Yeah, right. Yeah. But it's like, all right, that's that's weird. That's weird. So. Then two nights ago. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, to be now Sunday night for for those of you listening uh, Sunday night. Uh, my wife and I, it's late night. Everybody's pretty much in bed. My wife and I are on the couch watching a documentary. And all of a sudden we hear this um, really kind of bone chilling sound. And then the cats and my dog downstairs all start making noises. It gets so weird. Linus, my son, you know, he's the new dad. He comes upstairs and he goes, dad, uh, something's going on. I go, what do you mean? And he goes, the animals are all freaking out down here. The cats were all like, the dog is in his, in his kennel sleeping Hmm. and, uh, oh, you keep him in a kennel. No, he loves his kennel. That's where he goes at night. If you, he'll stand at the stairs and hit the, the gate, uh, to let you know he wants to go to bed. And we have like cushiony beds all over the house for him to lay on, but he wants to go lay in his kennel. So don't write to me with hatred. He goes in his kennel, but he's in his kennel cowering and, and the cats are all going, it was so chilling. Weird. We go to bed roughly two 30 in the morning. I'm sleeping and I wake up to this noise on my bedroom door and I sit up and I'm like, did I just hear that? And I'm like, uh, come in. Come in. I'm thinking it's one of my kids. Maybe they had a nightmare or something. Nothing. Dead silent. Maybe I was dreaming. Maybe it was that hypnagogic, hypnopompic state. And, uh, you know, my dream bled into reality. I go back to sleep. Two hours later, I hear much harder on my bedroom door. Hmm. Again, I sit up and I go, come in. My wife groggily looks at me. She's like, what? And I go, did you not just hear somebody pound on our bedroom door? She's like, no, but we do sleep with not one, but two fans in our room. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I get up and I open the bedroom door. There's nobody there. It's not the cats because when the cats do it, they do that rattling of the door. Right. This was boom, boom, boom. So I don't know what's happening. I've spoken out loud. I've done a couple prayers. Things will get quiet for a week or so. Then something else weird happens. During the filming this season, I'm very cautious, but damn it, there's one episode of the Holzer Files when we visit the Queen Mary. And there, you and I have been aboard the Queen Mary. It feels like home. Yeah. It's weird. It's haunted, mm-hmm. but it never felt threatening or menacing. Right. There are all these stories of something threatening and menacing. Now, on the ship that it's empty. The, the security gets freaked out by it. Employees get freaked out by it. So I wanted to see. I, I, I'm having a hard time. So I remove all my protection jewelry and didn't do my normal protective prayer going in. Mm. And I'm like, well, I want to see if there's legitimately something here. And it's not like I was trying to be reckless. But again, if you go in, my thoughts are, if there's a spirit who feels like, oh, look, at this guy is not the kind of guy I want to talk to. He's protected up to the hilt. He must not really want to have a ghostly encounter. You know, I, I just wanted the spirits to, con- that's the only way I figured I could convey this message. All right, look, I'm unimpeded. What do you want to tell me? And we capture something really weird and chilling, probably one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. And I don't know if I brought a friend home, but we also, you know, just lost my father-in-law this year as well. I don't know if it's him knocking around. I don't know what's going on, but I'll tell you, after the animals started acting that way, I called on her dad, her mom, and my mom's spirits, and I'm like, uh, you know, if there's something here, guys, help get it out, would you? Get it out of here. 
this isn't right. Um, it's, uh, you know, I don't know. It was bizarre. The knocking on the door really unnerved me. The knocking is, is bizarre, but you would think, you'd think knocking would not be, I'm trying to think of a, a good way of putting this. Knocking would not be the first thing that would happen. You would think if it were going to be something malevolent. You right. know, the, 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 the am- light yeah, what if I come in now before I frighten you, right? Exactly. Um, the, the, the animals acting up now that that's, you know, that's the first sign that something is not all kosher in, in trade right. land. Well, after we got home from filming, that was our season finale. That was our last episode we filmed. Mm-hmm. There is a woman that is seen aboard the queen Mary. Okay. And she, you don't ever really see her face, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's interesting. So my daughter, Ripley, is in her room, and Max wants to have a sleepover. And my daughters are really good. Max is eight years old. He still likes to have sleepovers and stuff, and the daughters will take turns letting them crash in their room, and they'll play games and watch movies and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Well, Ripley wakes up to see Max sitting in bed staring at her window. And she's like, Max, what's wrong? And he goes, I don't know who that woman is. And she goes, what do you mean? He goes, I can't see her face. Who's that woman? And Ripley's like, Max, what are you talking about? Are you awake? And he's just staring up at this thing, like mortified. Hmm. And he keeps telling her, I can't see her face. I can't see her face. And, you know. After that, she, my daughter got up, turned on the light, and then Max got up and went to the bathroom. So he was awake. This wasn't a sleepwalk moment. Yeah. And I had Ripley came in and told me the story, and I recorded it because I wanted to remember how she told it to me that night. But it was, it was bizarre, very strange. Um, so I don't know what's going on. I don't. I don't know. There's a. I'm gonna have to text you it later. There's a. There's a. You know, when I was going through my old van and I was cleaning it out after I'd gotten in the accident at Chicago ghost con, I found, I don't know if you remember it, but years ago we got a, we got a mineral from a listener in Australia in a pyramid form. And it's supposed to repel negative energy. Yep. Do you still have it? Yeah. I've got anytime people give me those minerals or stones and gems, I put them up throughout my house. Okay. So that they're in every room. I've got blessed, uh, I've got blessed um, rosary. I'm not even Catholic. I've got <laughs> I've got it all spread out throughout the house. That's okay. why I said this is that's what's making this a little bit more unnerving to me. Because uh, I have it. I think that's what kind of uh, ticked off the old man to begin with when I brought it. Because I brought it downstairs. Um, the old man ghost that we talked about on previous episodes. That's downstairs here with me. Um, but I kind of, I know it sounds kind of weird and it might sound weird to our listeners, but I, I kind of had a heart to heart with them. Yeah, yes. I actually talked out loud to the thin air. <laughs> it sounds weird. I know. No, no, that's part of what we do, dude. Um, but, um, since I've had this talk with him and, uh, I, you know, I, <laughs> you're going to laugh. I, I agreed we could have more sports programming on downstairs. We, you know, we could watch football together. Things have been quiet. Sounds weird, I know. But uh, so we watch Vikings games together. Nice. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when, when I come downstairs here to, to work on archives and stuff, I put on more Colin Coward uh, sports talk. And uh, so now, you know, he, he, he must do his work down at the workshop at the end of the hall. And, and uh, I do my stuff and I put on Colin Coward or sports talk or whatever. And then we watch uh, the Vikings on Sunday. I don't know what we're going to do when football season's over, but I guess I'm going to have to find a new sport for him. Maybe he's into hockey. Maybe we'll get into the Maybe. Minnesota Wild. But, um, you know, we seem to be okay for right now because I was kind of sweating there for a bit. I was thinking, you know, because the guy, I think this guy built this home from the ground up. I think this was his house. Um, and you don't want to you don't want to be the, the dick that ends up kicking the guy out of his house. Right. Right. You know, um, that's crazy. Yeah. Well, if he's there listening right now, feel free to whisper in on Tim's uh, microphone. Say hi. 
Oh, you could. You, you know what? This would be an interesting experiment. Because I'm trying to remember. I think the guy's name is Richard. I mean, not to be a dick about it, because that would be his nickname. Um, right. But I think the guy's name is Richard. So if Richard is here, I've got this. If, if he's not in the other room waiting for me to turn the TV on. Um, I got this thing that I'm talking into, which I'm talking to Dave on the other the other end. If you want to appear on a podcast, which is like radio, it's like I'm doing radio in here. You can speak into this thing that I'm speaking into, and you'd actually be talking to our, our worldwide audience. So you could do it at any time, and it'll appear, and our, our listeners will hear you throughout the world. We actually talk about ghosts. All right, nothing, but we don't know if it's not being picked up on the recording. That's right. So very cool. We'll have to listen back to the recording on this and, and see what happens. Uh, one more quick story before we go to break, Tim, and then the great Twinkie debate will be brought up after the break. Oh, um, this article starts off, body blow, dead man banned from his own funeral after family brought him to the church without a coffin. A dead man was refused to enter his own funeral after his body arrived sitting in a chair instead of being in a coffin. The funeral of Che Lewis, age 29, and his 54-year-old father, Adelaide Lewis, who were shot and killed in their home, took place on November 25th. Che's body was driven to the church on the chair in the tray of the hearse after his body was embalmed in a sitting position, giving him his last open-air ride before his burial. The bizarre funeral procession passed through Trinidad and Tobogo's capital, Port of Spain, on its way to the ceremony at St. John the Evangelist Church, in the town of Diego Martin. Dressed in white trousers and a pink suit coat, Jay was reportedly denied entry to the church by staff members who were astonished by what they saw. Videos and images circulating show the murder victim sat outside the church on the chair in a cordoned off area with many mourners not realizing it was him, assuming he was part of the procession. Some funeral goers are even said to have been berated the lifeless man for not wearing a face mask. The funeral was streamed online and gathered lots of attention, although some viewers also failed to realize Che was the man on the chair. Several videos of his final ride were posted on social media as the two men sat alongside the chair playing music out of speakers, with many commenting that it was proof that Trinidad is not a real place. His father, Adelaide, had been placed into a coffin by the family, unlike Che, who was positioned by Denny's funeral home. Their tagline, every life is unique, therefore every funeral should be unique, certainly rings true in Che's case, although his body was later placed in a casket for burial. The owner, Denny, told The Loop uh, the family requested it, but it was something we had on our bucket list to do. So we, in, uh, when the request came in, it wasn't foreign to us because we were aware of funerals like that abroad. We had him brought, uh, or we had him by us for three days to monitor how he was doing in the chair before we took it public, he said. The eccentric trend is known as extreme embalming, where bodies are preserved by injecting them with a chemical fluid, which makes them totally rigid. Extreme embalming is said to have originated in Puerto Rico in 2008 to give the deceased a more uh, celebratory send off. The demand for it is ever increasing, with people paying around $2,000 to have their loved ones somewhat resurrected before they are laid to rest. Corpses are then forced into the position by some particularly gruesome methods, such as having their feet nailed to the floor or poles erected behind their necks and even their limbs pried apart. Hmm. Police officer Brent Batson told local media outlet Trinidad Express, we are disappointed in the reckless behavior engaged by Denny's funeral. Carrying persons in a dangerous manner is an offense with a $750 penalty and the police will continue the investigation into the funeral company's conduct on the road. Local Catholic priests also slammed the stunt as disrespectful and suggested parishes will now request full details of future funerals. The father and son were buried in the St. John, the Evangelist Cemetery after the funeral. The pair were shot and killed at their home in Diego Martin on November 15th. Che's brother, uh, Abishah John, 45, was also shot in their family home on the 24th of July this year. So I'm going to put up this article, but with a fair warning that there are some weird images, people sitting there in very lifelike stances, most of them, of course, wearing sunglasses. Um, but yeah, they, like this one woman is positioned at her table with her hand on a wine glass and a cigarette between her fingers and they look lifelike. It's kind of like, what, you know, is that the way you want to see somebody? Yeah, I understand that wanting to make it seem more 
real. That's kind of the image you want to see of somebody's last image as opposed to the shell in a coffin. But uh, I'll put that article up for people to examine and take a look at for themselves. How about that, Tim? Sounds good. Let's take a quick break. We'll come back. We've got more Supernatural news right after this. Welcome back to the program. This is the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Darkness Radio. Listen, the holidays are upon us. Give the gift of Darkness Radio to your friends, relatives, neighbors, co-workers, maybe even people you don't like. Just let them know about Darkness Radio. Maybe it'll bring you all closer. That's all we ask. Share the show with three people this year. That's all. If each one of our listeners just shared the show with three people, Tim, we could be up to 30, 40 listeners by the end of the year. Yeah, it could be cool. Yeah. 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 Very exciting stuff. So if you get a chance, uh, do share the show. Don't, don't just hoard it to yourself. Let the rest of the world know about Darkness Radio. All right, Tim. The great Twinkie debate continues, rages on, as two different listeners send two differing stories, Tim, mm. to keep us moving. Uh, Let's start with my take, Tim, that uh, we are closer than ever to the zombie apocalypse. Are you ready? (laughs) Okay. Right. In a pretty dangerous case of crossed wires, a man who was proclaimed dead screamed as he came back to life as hospital staff began the process of embalming him. Peter Keegan, 32, woke up when the mortuary staff sliced his leg open, causing him to awaken and scream. The Kenyan man had been pronounced dead for four hours, as reported by Kenyan newspaper The Standard. From a village in Beretti, he collapsed with what is believed to be a stomach ailment while he was at home, with his family rushing him to the hospital on Tuesday afternoon. Keegan's brother says the nurse informed the family that he had died long before he got to the hospital. He told the news outlet the nurse later handed me a document to take to the mortuary attendant before my brother's body would be moved to the morgue. But four hours later, while mortuary staff were, pre- 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 were preparing to drain, this one's got me rattled, Tim. This is my nightmare situation. <laughs> but four years or four hours later, while mortuary staff were preparing to drain the blood of Keegan's body and start the embalming process. He suddenly sprang back to life and screamed. Keegan's uncle, Dennis Legant, claims his nephew regained consciousness, wailing in pain after the mortuary staff made an incision in his leg to start the embalming. His brother said, the mortician called me to the morgue. We saw him make movements. We were shocked. We could not understand how they could move a person who is still alive into the mortuary. But they did was dead. Keegan has a chronic illness and he told reporters what had happened from his hospital bed. He said, I cannot believe what just happened. How did they establish that I was dead? I didn't even know where I was when I regained consciousness, but I thank God for sparing my life. I will serve him for the rest of my life. But according to the medical chief of the hospital, Gilbert Shayarat said the family didn't even wait for his death certificate, instead whisked him off to the morgue. Dr. Sherratt said they moved him into the mortuary on their own. He said that doctors had been treating other patients. He added, they asked Keegan's relatives to take some time, but they accused the clinicians of taking too much time and decided to take him to the mortuary. It was while the mortician was getting ready to embalm his body that she noticed some signs of life, like him sitting up and screaming. Patient was later taken to the ward and is responding well to treatment. We hope to discharge him in just a few days. He urged families to follow correct protocol going forward. Before a body is moved to the mortuary, it has to be certified by a clinician. In Kaigan's case, he was. Uh, we can only say he was lucky, especially because of our qualified mortician who checked him before making any move. But she didn't. She cut his leg open to drain the blood. But I guess in a way that's, you know, checking. I wonder if he's really dead. What happens if I stab him in the leg? <laughs> Well, oh. okay, but in all fairness, no. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh-huh. I have neuropathy. If you were to stab right. me in the leg, I wouldn't feel it. Yeah. 
So well, I promised to poke you in the balls. How about that? Oh well, I would feel that. Right, I would. Right. I would. That, that, that I, way, I make sure you're still. You I know, would. That, I, that you're with us. I would come to life in a minute there, but if you if I were unconscious for any reason and someone stabbed me in the leg, I wouldn't feel it. I would. I would still be out. Look, I came back from the dead after four hours, Tim. <sighs> but here's your cute little story. Mm-hmm. Scientists create a lifelike material that has metabolism and seems to self-reproduce. Cornell University engineers have created an artificial material that has three key traits of life, metabolism, self-assembly, and organization. The engineers were able to pull off such a feat by using DNA in order to make machines from biomaterials that would have characteristics of alive things, dubbing their process DASH for DNA-based assembly and synthesis of hierarchical materials the uh, scientists made a dna material that was me- that has metabolism the set of chemical processes that convert food into energy necessary for the maintenance of life the goal for the scientists is not to create a life form but a machine with lifelike characteristics tim mm-hmm. Dan Lau, professor of biological and environmental engineering, pointing out, we are not making something that's alive, but we are creating materials that are much more lifelike than have ever been seen before. The major innovation here is the program metabolism that is coded into the DNA materials. The set of instructions for metabolism and autonomous regeneration allows the material to grow on its own. In their paper, the scientists describe the metabolism as the system by which the materials compromising life are synthesized, assembled, dissipated, and decomposed autonomously in a controlled hierarchical manner using biological processes. To keep going, a live or, or living organism must be able to generate new cells, which discarding old ones and waste. It is the process that the Cornell scientists duplicated using DASH. They devised a biomaterial that can arise on its own from nanoscale building blocks. It can arrange itself into polymers first and into mesoscale shapes after. The DNA molecules in the materials were duplicated hundreds of thousands of times, resulting in chains of repeating DNA that were a few millimeters in length. The solution with the reaction was injected into a special microfluidic device that facilitated biosynthesis. Mm. This flow washed over the materials, causing DNA to synthesize its own strands. The material even had its own locomotion, with the front end growing while the tail end was degrading, making it creep forth. Mm. It's back. This fact allowed the researchers to have portions of the materials competing against each other. Mm. The material that was created lasted for two cycles of synthesis and degradation, but the longevity can be extended, thinks the researchers. This could lead to more generations of the material, eventually resulting in a lifelike, self-reproducing machine. He also foresees that the system can result in self-evolutionary possibilities. Next to the material, the engineers are looking at how to get it to react to stimuli and be able to seek out light or food on its own. No. No. They also want it to be able to avoid harmful stimuli, like humans trying to kill it, Tim. Hmm. Just saying, the bet is intensifying. Guys coming back from the dead after four hours, lifelike metabolistic uh, machines. I don't know, man. It's weird. Things are getting weird. That's all I can say. Matt Reeves and Paranormal Activity producer have teamed for a 1940s horror movie called Switchboard. Director Matt Reeves is currently hard at work on the latest iteration of The Dark Knight with the forthcoming movie The Batman. Unfortunately, we have to wait until 2022 before we get to see it. But in the meantime, Reeves is dipping his toes back into horror by producing a new movie called Switchboard with Paranormal Activity producer Steven Schneider. What's the movie about? Hold on, Tim. I'm about to tell you. Man, are you pushy. Okay, jeez. The Hollywood Reporter has news on the Switchboard horror movie in the works. Though it doesn't appear to have a studio home yet, the story follows a young female switchboard operator in the 1940s who suddenly finds herself being targeted by an active serial killer who is called into the phone call service. As their conversation intensifies, she begins to question her safety, her sanity, and ultimately her very reality. Sounds like phone booth thrown back in time to me, but that doesn't mean 
It should just be disregarded. The movie is written by actor turned uh, screenwriter Devin Gray, who broke out as a uh, writer with Allison Adams, another spec script that made the blacklist in 2016 and is slated to be made at Sony Pictures. Gray also has a thriller called I See You, starring Helen Hunt, that played well at South by Southwest in 2019. He's also sold several other pitches to studios in recent years. So the writer is clearly turning out some good work. It'll be interesting to hear, huh? Yeah. So new movie in the works. I want to tell people too, HBO Max has got some stellar documentaries. And uh, there's a documentary that fits in with the viewership of our show and listenership, Tim. Um, there's a documentary called Heaven's Gate on HBO Max. Really compelling. It's like a four, I think it's a four part series, but it really goes into depth to describe this cult. And their belief in this UFO um, alien connection and the higher evolution of man. And it's really a compelling documentary to watch. So if you have HBO Max or you're considering it, pop it on, watch it, and see it for yourself. It's it's pretty crazy. I'm trying to get a guest on to talk about it. Hmm. Um, But a lot of the experts are like, I'm kind of done, you know, talking about Heaven's Gate. But uh, I'm still looking for somebody interesting to bring on because it's there's so many compelling aspects to the story i just i want to know more yeah yeah you wonder how do people make decisions like this and you watch the documentary and you kind of get it and what's really weird to me is how people that had left heaven's gate some of them a year or two beforehand felt survivor's guilt that they should have been there and ended up taking their lives after the fact to try to join their teammates their class, as it was called. Very strange. Very strange. All right. Uh, a couple more news stories to get into, Tim. Okay. If you don't mind. No. A whole paranormal investigator says he spotted not one but two ghosts on his way home from buying milk and tobacco. Simon Smirk, 40, claims to have taken pictures of specters in the trees on Salt House Road near Sutton Manor. Mr. Smirk was on his way home at 3 a.m. with his girlfriend on Wednesday, and he said he got a really bad feeling and began taking images on his phone to see if he could capture anything. He says that he snapped a picture of two ghostly figures and that when he saw the apparitions, he felt like he had been punched. I was going uh, only going to the garage to get some tobacco and some milk that night, but on the way home, I just felt something and started taking pictures. The pictures that I took show two ghostly figures, one taller than the other, and there's this really bad energy around them. When I saw them, I felt like someone punched me in the chest, and it made me very uneasy. I've not seen any apparitions before, and it really freaked me out. It has been just over a year since Mr. Smirks first started uh, sharing ghost hunting after he witnessed what he believes was a ghost moving a shampoo bar- uh, bottle in his partner's home. He has now invested in spirit boxes in which names can be heard, and now he wants to carry out more investigations after accidentally finding the ghostly presence this week. I've got Asperger's, and since I uh, was really young, I've been able to pick up on energies and feel them, and it kind of drains me, he said. All right, I'm looking at the picture. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the picture. I don't don't see anything. I, I just don't. Um, I mean, I see something over in the corner. I, I don't know. I'll put it up for listeners to go check darknessradio.com. Click on the news tab. You'll find all of the news stories that have video, uh, photographs and audio evidence or things like that, that we can share. Um, oh, I went back to the spot where I saw the ghost in daylight the next day. There was nothing there. So I definitely believe what I saw will stick with me for some time. I just, when Hmm. you, when you read that article, all I can think of now is that that bit from, I don't know if it's uh, Sesame Street or Electric Company, where <laughs> the kid's going to the store and trying to remember what they got to get. So I'm just oh, yeah. thinking milk. Loaf of bread, yeah. a stick of butter. Yeah, right. exactly, yeah. yeah. So a loaf of bread, some milk, tobacco, some ghosts, and a stick of butter. That's so, right. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. Crazy. All right, uh, Queensland, Tim. We're going to the land down under. Cool. Down under. Down under. Ah. Uh-huh. To the down under. Ha ha. <laughs> a pair of ghost hunters will never forget the moment they heard a conversation between the spirits of a warden and two patients during a visit to an old mental asylum where torture and abuse were once commonplace. Callie Jade and Jameson McKenzie from the Gold Coast in Queensland have only been tracking ghosts since October of this year. 
So they're new to this genre, Tim. They're rookies. But what they've seen and heard so far is enough to make them truly believe in the spirit world's existence. Can't talk, an eerie voice creaked through the speaker of a device with the couple used to communicate with souls that are trapped here on Earth. Walston Park Asylum in Brisbane's southwest changed names often over its 150-year history, but it was considered a lunatic's asylum until the 70s and is best known for the horrific treatment of the patients who were meant to be in state care. And the ghost hunter says it is one of the most confronting places they've been to to communicate with the dead so far. We could tell a lot about the people and uh, based on their voices. They claim to have heard a baby come through at the river and heard three men and two women in the main building. We think one was the warden. He scared the others. They said, can't talk. Then the next said, who's that? Then, oh, it's you. Like they were having a conversation with themselves. The video shows Jameson asking questions to a seemingly empty room before demanding if something had touched him, telling whatever it was, it had no right. Then the spirit box, a common tool for paranormal communication, which continuously scans for white noise, did something extraordinary. It muted. It isn't even a function that it has. It was scanning, but there was no sound for two minutes. So you you hear the... And then it just kicks on two minutes later again. Later that day, we were down by the river and all the gear turned on and it was a baby playing with it. The couple don't call themselves ghost hunters, rather paranormal investigators and work to prove if heritage sites are haunted. They also work with psychics on cold cases free of charge at the behest of families who need support, understanding what happened to the people they love. The couple first get into communicating with the spirit realm after the death of their fourth child in utero. Kelly revealed how delivering her stillborn daughter, Halo, 22 weeks, left the family devastated, looking for a way to heal. Nothing can prepare you for losing your baby, she said. And there we go. I've never had any problems with a pregnancy before and I've had three other children. It was hard to go through the labor knowing I wouldn't have a live baby to hold and bond with at the end. She believes the loss led them to where they are now. We wanted to know there was something else after death that our daughter was okay, she said. The couple began researching how to communicate with the spirit realm as neither have psychic abilities. They bought ghost chasing gear from America to pick up on the subtle energy changes indicating the presence of a spirit. The first night they went out on their with their gear was enough to make them realize they wanted to pursue paranormal investigation in a professional capacity. They drove to a place on the highway where a fatal accident happened years before. They were so clear, so intelligent when they responded. They asked for help and got us to relay messages to their families. The test run was just to see if the equipment was working, but it left them speechless. Another visit to a highway location left Callie struggling to breathe after her partner left her alone in the car with the spirit box. I was alone, and suddenly this overwhelming feeling came over me. I've never experienced anything like it in my life. I felt heavy dread in my chest and throat like I was going to vomit everywhere. I wasn't in control, and it just felt like something heavy was sitting on me. Callie said she turned off the spirit box in a bid to gain control. They are starting a documentary series and also hold Facebook live events with psychics on their Paranormal Australia page. So there you have it, Tim. We heard ghost stories from the land down under. Down under. Down under. Ha ha. (laughs) Let's see where we go next. Um, Ooh, a refurbished ghost seat has returned to a Florida theater, Tim. Yeah, you heard me right. Hmm. Is there a ghost in the Florida theater and does it have a favorite seat? If so, the spirit can rest easy. The Florida theater has unveiled its refurbished ghost seat that gained fame on local and national TV. The lore started in 1997 when the WJCT public television examined the theater in a production that used psychic consultant Jill Cook Richards. She claimed a male ghost spoke to her and said he wanted to be called Jay for joy, which is what he felt for the theater. He said he didn't need a name from his past, that he wanted a name for his future, said Cook Richards. Then in 2010, the locally produced TV show Local Haunts, which aired on CW17, conducted a paranormal investigation of the theater. Local Haunts captured images of what it claims was a ghastly and ghostly apparition of a man sitting in the balcony in section 500, row E, seat 2. 
Steve Christian, who led the local haunts team, called it the holy grail of paranormal investigation. That, in turn, sparked the sci-fi channel's fact-or-faked paranormal files to show uh, to try to debunk the local findings. Using infrared cameras, thermal imaging, and EVB recorders, the theater said Factor faked heard noises and discovered heat signatures in two places in the orchestra section and in the very balcony seat where Steve Christian's apparition appeared. The show said it found zero proof that the local haunts video was faked. This fall, the theater installed new historically accurate seating. However, it was decided that the ghost seat and its companion seat, Section 500, Row E, Seat 1, would be the only seats to be restored, refurbished, and reinstalled. We did not want our ghost to be homeless if his or her seat went away permanently. They were the only two seats being restored. Every other seat is just being replaced, said the Florida Theater President Numa Saleslin in the email to WJCT News. The ghost seat and its companion seat were refurbished in Grand Rapids, Michigan by Irwin Seating Company. I'll have this story up, Tim, because they actually include in this article the uh, link to the episode of Fact or Fake so you can see the video footage of the ghost in the seat. And it is pretty compelling. I remember seeing this episode when it first aired. Our buddy Bill Murphy was, of course, part of that, as well as Jael DePardo, Ben Hansen. Pretty amazing series. Uh, I think it was a little too before its time. I wish they'd re- re-invite it or reinvent uh, it and bring it back now. Yeah, for real. All right, Tim. Our final batch of stories um, are UFO-related. And... Uh, Let's, I, I guess, let's start with this one. I've got a lot here, so I'm trying to figure out. Bermuda Triangle Mystery, Australian expert, is trying to solve the fate of a lost flight after 75 years. 75 years after the disappearance of five aircraft and their entire crews over the notorious Bermuda Triangle, an Australian researcher has thrown new light on the mystery. On December 5th, 1945, five U.S. Navy torpedo bombers known as Flight 19 took off from their Florida base on a routine training mission. But within hours, all 14 crew members and their aircraft vanished after entering the Bermuda Triangle in an area of water spanning up to 4 million square kilometers and bordered by the U.S. southeast coast, Bermuda, and Puerto Rico. A rescue plane sent out to find them also disappeared with the loss of 13 men. Some of the pilots reported their compasses not working and navigation near impossible as stormy weather rolled in. In one of the last radio messages received, Lieutenant Charles Taylor, the flight commander, reported, We are entering white water. Nothing seems right. We don't know where we are. The water is green. No, white. Now, the mystery of Flight 19, or the Lost Patrol as it's become known, and subsequent unexplained disappearances of planes and ships over the same body of water propelled the Bermuda Triangle into popular culture. These stories captivated the public. Some people gave extraordinary explanations, claiming there was something paranormal or supernatural going on. Australian researcher Shane Satterley uh, explained, Some of the wild speculation about the cause of the plane's disappearance included UFOs and even an underwater city. Conspiracy theorists over the following years were also fueled by the official U.S. Navy report that put the incident down to case and cause unknown. But Mr. Satterley of Griffiths University in Queensland said a level of critical thinking is needed to try and piece together what really happened to Flight 19. We should ask ourselves, if we don't know, why did I go into a Kennedy voice, Tim? (laughs) Ask not what your UFOs can do for you, but what you can do for UFOs. We asked ourselves, if we don't know what caused something or if something appears entirely mysterious, should we look for the answer in the paranormal? Mr. Satterley said other factors are worth considering in looking for answers. The investigation found that as it got dark outside and the weather changed, Taylor had navigated the planes to the wrong location. Taylor also had a history of getting lost while flying. He had twice needed to be rescued in the Pacific Ocean. This was your lead guy? Good grief. The Grumman Avenger torpedo bomber aircraft flown by Flight 19 were notorious for sinking in less than a minute when they were forced to make a sea landing. And once aircraft sink in the vast ocean, they are often never found again. This is true even today. For example, only a small amount of debris from the missing Malaysia Air Flight MH370 flight, which disappeared in 2014, has been found. 
Another key factor was the experience of many of the other pilots of Flight 19. Most of the pilots involved in the incident were trainees. This means they weren't properly taught how to use all their aircraft instruments when flying at night or in bad weather. Research has also shown that the number of ships and aircrafts reported missing in the Bermuda Triangle is not much larger, proportionally speaking, than in any other part of the ocean, Mr. Satterley said. But if a thousand aircraft fly into the Bermuda Triangle, and we can't explain what happened to 990 of them, should we say the other 10 were supernatural cases? I don't think we should. All we can say is we don't know what happened for sure, and we should try to learn more about them. So he's saying, you know, obviously, let's look at this. But here's another story that comes out of the Bermuda Triangle. Tim, this is new to me. Are you ready? Okay. A strange triangle flew out of the ocean near the U.S. Navy, and they have no idea what it is. The mysterious triangular aircraft seen by Navy pilots, Navy pilots, in 2019 is reportedly still an unidentified flying object. Tim McMillan of the debrief gave an exclusive look at the Pentagon's ongoing research of what the government calls unidentified aerial phenomena. Do, 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 do. Phenomena. Do, 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 do. Phenomena. In 2020, a report from the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force, there is allegedly a photo of a triangle-shaped UFO taken in 2019 by an F-A-18 fighter pilot. The photo is reportedly extremely clear, according to sources who spoke with McMillian. The triangle-shaped UFO reportedly came out of the ocean near a Navy ship and ascended upwards at a 90-degree angle, the Washington Examiner reported. Sources would give no further details on the incident. In 2018, a report from the... uh, UAPTF uh, says an unidentified flying object shown in photos taken by naval aviators in 2015 were not ruled out as being alien. So they they didn't rule it out being alien in nature, Tim. They're saying that clearly. This was not ruled out as being alien. Hmm. This seems very similar to the infamous 2004 incident with another UFO. Two Navy commanders were participating in training mission when a similar scenario happened to them, according to the New York Times. Basically, it's been 16 years and we still don't know exactly what these UFOs are. They seem to be able to go underwater and fly in the air at the same time, and UAPTF has not ruled it out as being alien or non-human. 2020 just cannot get any weirder, Tim. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, yeah, let me not throw that to the universe. Yeah. It's just, uh, I, I pull that back. I want it back, please. There's still a few weeks left. <laughs> a cloaked UFO was caught on a security camera passing over a home in Irving, Texas. As we edge closer and closer to the truth about UFOs and the reconnaissance aliens have been conducting over the past several decades, and especially during this global pandemic, what little technological advances we have uh, made here in the 21st century continue to help us expose and understand what is happening in that regard. While the United States government continues to drag its heels when it comes to releasing its knowledge on the subject, tools like the Internet, security cameras, and cell phones uh, have made it the simplest and has been uh, – has ever been to sh- it has made it simplest it has ever been sorry to share and analyze what little data civilians have uncovered a perfect example of this quick and easy dissemination of information comes to us today in the form of home security camera video of a ufo caught passing over a home in Irving, Texas, on October 19, 2020. The video, which shows a very large, mysterious object in the sky that appears to be a cloaked UFO of some sort, caught the attention of noted UFO and alien experts who discussed the sighting. A door security cam alerted a person that it had recorded something that may be important. When they looked at the video, they saw a large object passing over their home. The object is huge, like the size of a 747, but it's not a plane because it has no wings, body it lights it's just a cloud because it's moving and and it's not a cloud because it's moving really fast however it does look like a cloaked ufo the security cam is using a special ir infrared camera to record at night the human eye cannot see infrared light but the camera can and did this one is flying really low i would say 300 meters above the ground it's and i'm looking at the video it's pretty crazy i I don't know what I'm looking at. Uh, This will be another story you can find on uh, darknessradio.com. Click on the news tab, and uh, all shall be revealed to ye who go there. Ye who are brave enough to go there, Tim. Hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Cops and saucers. 
which is your uh, rap album from 1989, if I remember, Tim. Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh huh. Well, uh, the Yorkshire wants a part of this as well. A traffic cop reckons he has caught an eerie glowing UFO in his dash cam. Video footage shows a weird glowing blob hovering above a hill as the officer drives along the A-59 between Skipton and Bolton Abbey in North York's. In the clip, an intermittently glowing bright white light that the cop said appeared to be made up of a smaller cluster of glowing orbs hovers in midair before just disappearing. Former detective Gary Hazelty, now a full-time UFO expert, said of the footage, I cannot think of a rational explanation for such a tight cluster of lights. Gary, who was sent uh, the footage by the unnamed UFO spotting officer, handed the video to the U.S. UFO hunters team who confirmed it was genuine. The team of TV alien experts said the clip showed an unidentified anomalous light. But Gary, who is also editor of UFO Truth Magazine, added the camera footage did not capture in sufficient detail what the officer actually saw. He described a packed cluster of small, very bright lights. He said the officer who spotted the cluster was adamant the object was not a searchlight or an aircraft using its afterburner after he slowed down his patrol car to catch a more detailed glimpse. Citing the Pentagon's December 2017 admission that real unidentified objects are flying around in U.S. airspace, which exhibit flight characteristics way beyond the technology of our latest flighter jets, Gary said, I would speculate that these things are also doing the same thing in the U.K. Gary took early retirement in 2013 to become a full-time UFO detective after serving for 24 years in the British Transport Police. For the past three years, he has been investigating Britain's answer to the Roswell incident, the infamous Rendlesham Forest, as part of his research for an upcoming feature-length documentary. He has uncovered a wealth of new information on the case, which will only be released when the film comes out in the spring of 2021. So there you have it. Uh, Interesting stuff. I'll put that video up again. I'm putting a lot of videos up this week, Tim. So go to darknessradio.com, click on the news tab. You'll see that story. Our final two stories as we wrap up here today, Tim, uh, also UFO related. Okay. The UFO has been filmed over ancient city in Greece. It's the same one spotted in Jerusalem back in 2011, according to experts. A forest in Mexico, the United Arab uh, Emeritus, and the Dominican Republic, and now Thessaloniki, Greece, all places where mysterious UFOs have been spotted and filmed over the past three weeks. It looks like the aliens have not only decided that camouflaging their craft is not as big a priority as it used to be, they have also started to expand their areas of inspection as Greece becoming a more prominent UFO hotspot. The latest UFO sighting took place in August, and the video was uploaded to the internet by YouTuber Greek Power. It was later brought to the attention of prominent UFO Uh, and uh, alien experts, watch the video and you will see a huge flashing UFO over the ancient city of Thessaloniki, Greece. The city was founded over 2,335 years ago in 315 BC. That makes this area a very important location since aliens can monitor the human inhabitants over a long time period and make accurate predictions of the future of the city. This glowing light looks similar to the one seen back in 2011 over Dome of the Rock, Holy Temple, in Jerusalem, in which thousands saw the UFO and recorded it. This, the same UFO. So I've got the video. Both videos, actually, Tim, that people can see. They can see the one over Greece and the one over uh, Temple Mount. So go check it out, darknessradio.com. Click on the news tab. And, Tim, do you fancy a trip back in time? Oh, sure, yeah. How about if that trip back in time was to the Playboy Club? (laughs) Well, yeah, sign me up. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, from the archives, UFO sightings over the Playboy Club back in 1974. A number Now, this article first appeared in regional news February 7th, 1974, under the headline, UFOs Seen in Area. It's been reprinted um, and published uh, through newspapers.com. Here's the original article. A number of, of area residents have reported sighting unidentified flying objects last Wednesday night in the Lake Geneva area. Reports of the sightings have come in as far away as Delavan and as close to the city as the Playboy Club Hotel. Although times of the sightings and detailed descriptions vary slightly, the seven people interviewed by regional news all gave the same general descriptions of the flying objects. From a distance, the UFO pierces a bright stars in the sky, according to observers. They attract attention because of their brightness, and after remaining in one position for about 30 seconds, the stars suddenly take off without noise. 
That's what the observers are reporting. Because of the hovering nature of the objects, they were at first believed to be Coast Guard helicopters, which occasionally run training exercise in the area. But Coast Guard officials in Milwaukee and Chicago reported that they were conducting no such training exercise in the area on Wednesday. Officials at Yerkes Observatory in Williams Bay said that they observed nothing unusual Wednesday night, but said it was possible that something could fly in the area without being uh, observed at the observatory. The longest sightings of the UFOs was reported by Wayne Craig and Steve Hanchette, both Playboy Club employees. The two men said they observed three UFOs for a period of three hours between 7 and 10 p.m. Other observers included a number of Playboy employees, including a sergeant on the security force in uh, a family in Elkhorn and at least 15 other area residents. Craig and Hanchette said that they saw a number of cars parked on Sheridan Springs Road behind the Playboy Cub with the occupants looking up observing these flying objects. The two men themselves said that they first saw the UFOs when they were driving to work at 7 p.m. between Elkhorn and Lake Geneva on Highway 12. They said that they saw two bright stars high above the road in front of them. At first, they thought they were merely stars, but they kept observing them because they wondered um, the article just jumped on me. I apologize. <clears throat> they wondered why they'd never noticed these bright stars before. All of a sudden, the two stars took off, according to the two men, one north, one south. It was spooky, Craig said. As the objects took off, they dimmed, the men said. And while in motion, they each had two blinking lights, much like the wingtip lights on an airplane, except that the lights were both white. They said that they first thought they were the only that there were only two of them. However, when they arrived at the Playboy Club, they noticed a single right star off in the distance. Suddenly, the other two flying objects converged on it, they said, and then the single star took off and the other two followed. The two men said they drove to Lake Geneva and reported the sightings to the police. And although they could not observe the UFOs in town because of the light interference, they later saw them again from the lake shore. Craig said that he ruled out the possibility of the objects being conventional airplanes because of their hovering ability, and they were much too large and fast to be helicopters, he said. They also made no noise, according to the observers. Craig took photos of the UFOs, but they did not turn out. The pictures were taken at night with a small camera and slow film. Their closest observation of the objects came while they were at the Playboy Club, the men said. At close range, the objects appeared to have a pattern of five light spaces as a five on, uh, on the uh, dice. Richard Beischel, a sergeant at the Playboy Security Force, told the regional news that he alerted to the objects by Craig. He agreed with the description given by Craig and Hanchette, but added that the lights appeared to be rotating. Beischel said that he himself observed the UFOs for approximately one hour. He also said he called his mother at home and told her where to look in the sky for the objects and that she saw them too. Another Playboy employee, whips, uh, William Gozi, said that he too saw the objects Wednesday night, that he had also observed them three times before. Craig told the regional news that he believed that the objects were either vehicles from another planet or some kind of experimental aircraft that is very uh, that is very much being kept a secret. The second explanation seems more feasible, but as yet, the objects have not been identified. Really weird. 1974, for a three-hour exercise, people saw this take place. And, Whoa. Tim, there's no pictures of Playboy bunnies no? in the article, so you need to post it, right? Uh. <laughs> now there's no ufos there's nothing really to see in the article it's just a reprint of the article story itself and, and the strange things that they saw hmm. huh tim yes i would be remiss to not read a few stories and especially when one starts with my paranormal mcrib experience <gasps> uh-huh really uh-huh yeah tim it's been a week since the mcrib has made its return thank the gods i have slaked my thirst for McRibs almost every day. Greetings and salutations, Dave and Tim. That's how this email begins in the most hoity way. I enjoy the McRib almost as much as you two. With the recent release of the McRib, I found the urge to enjoy one or three. After some terrible meetings on Wednesday as lunch rolled around, I finally found myself in the drive through lane at McDonald's. May I take your order, said the nice young lady. Three McRibs and an unsweet iced tea, please, I replied. The moment was near and the anticipation was great. In just a few minutes, I would be enjoying all the greatness that is the McRib. Yeah. Finally, after a couple of minutes in line, I have the brown bag with the three glorious sandwiches in hand. Three sandwiches at one time. I applaud you, sir. I'm just going to stop there. And I'm going to give uh, Nathan the clap. Hey, I'll admit I've done three before. I can't too, is it? Uh, I'm pushing it on two. Although there's uh, two McDonald's by me that are very stingy with the sauce, and that's really what helps make the sandwich, yeah. is it needs to be sloppy. 
No, there. I I have to order extra sauce at some because they yeah. they do get stingy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I make my way to a small park on my way back to the office. I eat the first sandwich quickly, then slowly enjoy the second while listening to a podcast. It was pure delight. There was simply no room for the sur- third, so I put it back in the bag and sit for about twenty minutes. I'm in no hurry to get back to the office. About three years ago, I was diagnosed with type two diabetes. I try really hard to control the diabetes with my diet. I avoid bread as much uh, sugar as possible. In fact, these two sandwiches were the first bread I've eaten in several months. I get terrible diabetic neuropathy in my feet and lower legs. I figured the neuropathy would show up in a couple of hours, but I was prepared for it. That's commitment right there, Tim. Commitment to the McRib. That is, yeah, yeah. This guy should be committed. Either way, my way back to work is a pretty short drive. A stoplight, then a left turn up a hill, another stoplight, left turn, and a right turn. Easy peasy. I do this drive every day. As I make the first left turn, suddenly I have an out-of-body experience. It felt like I was being struck by lightning. I looked down, and I realized I was looking at the top of my van. Then I snap. I'm back in my body with absolutely grueling pain. As I come to the top of the hill, I pull over. I had just received the worst electrical diabetes nerve pain in my life. The damn McRib sandwiches caused a huge neuropathy, uh, neuropathic pain in my nut sack that nearly killed me. Oh. The normal neuropathy pain and tingling went on for about three hours. Thankfully, the lightning pain only lasted 30 to 45 seconds. That's a long time, folks. Hold your breath right now for 30 to 45 seconds. Yeah. Realize how long that is and realize sharp electric pain for that amount of time. In those first three seconds of pain, I had a near death and out of body experience. That is the most paranormal event I've ever had. Love the show and have been listening for many, many years on all different formats. Dave and Tim, I truly appreciate you guys. Peace and love, Nathan. Did you eat the third sandwich, Nathan? Oh, I'm sure he got around to it. Even after getting electric shock to the balls, is McRib worth it? Y- yeah, well, yeah. Yes, <laughs> Get me, yes, come on. You answered your own question. I know. I know. I know. Hey, D and T, you guys rock. I enjoy the show and work on television. Both of you, my story begins two years ago on November 10th, 2018, in the Honey Island Swamp. Two best friends go hunting as they often did. They'd grown up hunting in the deep woods of the swamp, hunting for ducks, deer, wild pigs, fishing, and even gators. It was the favorite ass time for the both of the young men the two absolutely love the outdoors and were experienced outdoorsmen as fate would have it tragedy struck when in a horrific moment of mistaken identity identity one friend accidentally shot the other thinking him to be an animal and not knowing exactly where his position was it was a moment that changed everything in that moment a young man's life ended his best friend left to blame himself and fall into deep despair this young man who lost his life, mother is my friend. She has since found out that her son had fathered a daughter before this, or before his death. Not knowing that the living situation was for his newly found granddaughter, my girlfriend traveled to another state to check on the child and meet her grandfather for the first time. As it turns out, the child was being very well taken care of, which of course was a huge relief for my girlfriend, as the loss of her son was also the gain of a granddaughter. Upon returning home from the visit, my girlfriend stopped at Stucky's for coffee, walking past the front of the store where ice machines and a firewood display before you entered the doors. As she, as she and her husband passed the display, a large black raven flew between them, landed on the firewood, and began to sing a tune and make odd noises directed to my girlfriend. They both stopped and watched, shocked at the complete tameness of this wild bird the bird continued to sing as my girlfriend got out her phone and videotaped this messenger and harbinger my girlfriend absolutely believes this was her son's messenger thanking them for checking on his daughter i'm attaching the a video uh she took of the raven i didn't get the video i didn't get the video ah oh, brutal i'd love to see that video mm-hmm. send it again I don't know if it's Janice, J-A-N-N-E-S, Roast, or Giannis. Send it to me, please. Uh, Dear Dave and Tim, or Tim and Dave, just kidding. Oh, I miss Mally. Longtime (laughs) fan since 2009. Don't miss Mally. Mally's still alive. She's doing, uh, as a matter of fact, I think the eighth episode of On the Fox with Mally Rocks. No, On the the Rocks with Mally Fox. 
<laughs> on a box with Mally Tox. No, is, uh, no, what? no, no. What? What's the show? On on the rocks with Mally Fox. Okay, so on the rocks with Mally Fox yes. is available. The eighth episode Tim and Mally just released, so that's mm-hmm. out there. Longtime fan since 2009. Coast to coast was out of my reach then. I found you guys and couldn't have been happier. You made me laugh out loud, smile and sing on many occasions, drawing eyes while I work. Phenomena, snallygaster. I listen via podcast since the beginning. I wanted to say thank you. I've learned so much about myself listening to you both practically religiously. The term empath really changed my life. It explained why I couldn't understand why I had experiences with all of Claire's. I've uh, bought many books through your links and plan on getting your book. Just wish it would be signed. Well, my book, uh, The Other Side, A Guide to Ghost Hunting and the Paranormal, you can get a signed copy of that by going to Darkness Radio, click on the store tab, scroll down the page, and you'll see my book there. And all you have to do is order it. And it's, I think it's 10 bucks plus like five bucks shipping or something, four bucks shipping. I'll sign it, send it off. So you can go order that. If you're talking about the book I'm writing about my paranormal experiences, that probably won't be coming out until after the beginning of the new year, but that book should be coming out and I'll make uh, signed copies available of that as well. We go back to the email. It says, I do have one story and request for you both. I know I'm sorry. It's only one. I just got up the nerve to do this. My fiance and I come home from a family, uh, come from a family rather of gifted people gifted. I mean, spiritually. So it's only natural that some messages get passed around that come true. My fiance, uh, have been together for, uh, since Oh nine, as well as we have a four year old, um, as of, uh, December 6th, 20. Okay, so on December 6th, two days ago, uh, it was his daughter's birthday. Or did I say a daughter? We have a four-year-old. That's all they said. Uh, Those stories are there, but for another time. The messages uh, were that we were meant to have twins. Yeah, joke about twins in the beginning of our relationship. No thanks, we'd say. Two grandparents, an aunt, multiple others all joked about it uh, through our first pregnancy. Since then, some have passed. Now... For the ask and the best part. The other day we had a scare. There was blood, not usually a good sign. It's still early, like nine weeks early. A night, hours of stress work, and a doctor appointment later I get a call, everything is okay. Which one do I want to know about first? The ask is, can we send out a widespread of prayer, all religions for a safe pregnancy? Okay, Army of Darkness, you heard that. Make sure that you... Uh, put out a big prayer for James Goodspeed and his family. Um, these things work out. I got the dream girl. I got the very first car I wanted. Wasn't a Ford Escape, but a Mercury Mariner. It was better. That same week we uh, got it, we found out about our first son. Dream job nine months after he was born. Almost four years later, new Ford Explorer. Same week, second baby. Well, nine weeks in second and third, I could keep going, but I shouldn't. I will try to write again, but then, uh, thank you for being yourselves, Dave. Sorry for your loss, Tim. I'm happy to hear you're still fighting and as healthy as can be your longtime listener, James Goodspeed. So listeners put out a prayer for James and his family for a safe and healthy delivery. James, thanks for listening all this time and writing in. That's it for today. We are done, Tim, believe it or not. I know it's hard to believe. It is hard to believe. Yeah. But uh, the end has come for today. But that doesn't mean that we're done for the week, Tim. I don't know if you know this, but we have another show tomorrow. Yeah. Deceptive Gods with Lauren Therian. We're going to face off with Deceptive Gods confronting the divine and demonic with Lauren J. Therian Sr. So make sure that you tune in tomorrow for more of the best in paranormal talk radio. I'm Dave. That's Tim. This is Darkness Radio. Darkness Radio.